The Center for Chinese Studies public lecture series is only a small part of what we contribute to U of M and the Ann Arbor community. As one of the country's oldest and largest intellectual hubs for understanding China, we administer master degree programs, provide fellowships to graduate students who study China, we support faculty research, we put on conferences and events, like the, our weekly noon lecture series, our film series, and tonight's public lecture. If you'd like to see more uh, events like this, we have a card that we've been giving out, um, and you can look at the back on the program, and we invite you to come and speak to myself or to any of our staff who are over here, Ina, Carol, Anna, uh, Jen is down there, Jen, um, and, uh, and talk to us about events that you'd like to see in the future. Okay, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Alexander Harney has been writing about Asia for more than a decade. She's the author of The China Price, The True Cost of Chinese Competitive Advantage, which was published by Penguin Press in 2008. She also covered Hong Kong, China, and Japan for the Financial Times, and she was an editor at the newspaper in London. From 2003 until 2006, she was the Financial Times South China correspondent. Alexander's work has also been published in many international newspapers and magazines, including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Far East Ec Economic Review, and Mary Claire. I'm really interested in what the Mary Claire article was. <clears throat> she has contributed to National Public Radio and the BBC World Service, and was a regular business and economics commentator on Japanese television. A 1997 cum laude graduate of Princeton University, she speaks Japanese and Mandarin Chinese. And I'd just like you to know that after she gives this talk, she will be going to Washington where she will testify, and I think we will be much nicer to her. Thank you. Something good value. I've been thinking a lot about this question over the last several years as I've been traveling between my house in Hong Kong and mainland China to research Chinese factories, first as a reporter for the Financial Times, and then more recently as an author. In that time, I've gotten to know a man whose arm was severed in a machine when he was making plastic bags. I visited the widow of another man who died of a lung disease he contracted while polishing jewelry in a factory. I've traveled to coal mining towns where the air is so polluted that people hook themselves up to intravenous strips in their homes just to try to clear out their lungs. All of this so we in America can buy a cheaper television or a cheaper pair of shoes. At the same time, I, like all of you, have been learning about the heparin that is contaminated that comes from China. We're all realizing that there's pollution coming from China that's turning up on the west coast of America. And we're discovering that those manufacturing jobs that are so important to the economies of Michigan, North Carolina, Ohio, that those jobs are not coming back. They're not coming back in part because the prices that we expect to pay for a lot of the goods that we use every day are so low that we can't even manufacture those goods in America anymore. Is this really good value? This is what I'd like to talk to you about tonight. It's a subject I care deeply about and one I believe it affects all of us here very directly, whether we're from China or America or anywhere else whether we're concerned about job losses in America, whether we're concerned about the future of the Chinese economy, or whether we're concerned about the health of our planet. I think we can all agree that now, as we're facing the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, and since we are realizing that the American and the Chinese economies are intimately interwoven, now is a good time to consider whether capitalism and globalization are working the way that we had hoped to and making the kind of world that we want them to make. So I'm very grateful to Ina Schlorf and to Mary Gallagher and to all the rest of the staff at the Center for Chinese Studies for inviting me here tonight to speak with you. The China Price, the, the title of my book, is a term that executives started to use about six years ago to describe these ultra-low prices coming out of China, a half, a fifth of the price of a good made in America. How is this even possible? This was the question that I started my research uh, about, about six years or five years ago. The answer you'll get from some people, how is this possible, is that it's because China manipulates its currency and provides hefty subsidies to exporters. Even if you ask people in China, they'll tell you, well, it's really easy. I don't know why you bother investigating that question. It's because China's labor is cheap. I think all of these things have played a role in China's 
uh, incredible competitiveness over the last two decades. And they certainly have played a role in making our lifestyles more affordable. But I do think, after having done research on this question for several years now, that there is more to it than just those handful of factors. There are many genuine good reasons why Chinese factories are so competitive, but there are also other reasons that are less attractive. I believe the China price was the result of the collision of several factors. A huge, hard-working labor force. A government that put growth before environment and labor protection. Low barriers to entry that allowed masses of factories to move into southern China in particular, many of them grouped together in highly competitive industrial clusters. As we were having our housing boom here in America, China was having its own factory boom of, of plants that were able to produce the televisions and the, and the picture frames that we needed to fill our new homes. And finally, another factor is that very powerful American retailers were able to hammer down the prices of Chinese-made goods with only superficial regard for the human and environmental consequences of their actions. Let's take these issues one by one. China has the world's largest manufacturing workforce with 105 million people. In the export sector, many of these people are migrant workers, people who come from the countryside, farmers essentially, come into the cities for years at a time and work you know, often for you know, around the clock. There are some 150 million migrant workers of this kind in China. And because they come from the countryside, the government considers them rural workers. And so migrants are often, or generally, denied the benefits that urban workers receive. They're a little bit like undocumented Mexican migrants in our own country, except these are migrants within their own country's borders. In the city of Shenzhen, for instance, migrants pay up to three times as much for the education of their children as the locals do. They're much, likely, much less likely to be covered by insurance, for instance. Only about a quarter of migrant workers uh, in the factories that I was researching actually were covered. The worker I mentioned earlier who died of a lung disease is a man called Deng Wenping. He worked for a decade in jewelry factories polishing stones. At factories like his factory, at the end of the day, the workers would emerge from the factory covered in dust, the color of the stones that they'd been polishing. The only thing you could see were their eyes. And you can imagine that Deng's lungs were filled with the same dust. One morning, Deng went for a jog, as he did every morning, and he came back really short of breath. And when he was diagnosed, they found out that he had silicosis, which is an incurable lung disease. His wife says that after he was diagnosed, he was fired by his jewelry factory. He had no insurance. Deng spent the last five years of his life fighting for compensation for his illness. He eventually won 30,000 US dollars just months before his death. He was 36. One of the surprising things about China is that many workers don't even see the value in being covered by insurance. Under the Chinese system, pensions are not portable, and insurance is bought as a package, including that pension. So if you, if you buy into a, a, a pension and insurance package, you can't take it across prov provincial boundaries. You cannot then recoup the benefits that you have paid into. So most migrant workers I talk to would rather not sign up for insurance at all. There's a similar story with working hours in China. China's labor laws are among the strictest in the world. They limit employees to 44 hours a week, plus three hours of overtime a day, up to 36 hours a month. That's much more strict than America. Compared to other countries like Vietnam, India, or Bangladesh, Chinese factory wages of $120 or $150 a month in the South are high. But compared to the living costs in these cities and compared to the often very dire financial needs of some of these workers, Chinese wages are still relatively low. So many migrants would rather work around the clock, much longer than the law requires, often seven days a week, 16 hours a day. And of course, they don't get paid for all that overtime that they're putting in. When I first started visiting Chinese factory workers back in 2003, 2004, I'd often have to go at 11 PM just so I could get access to the workers. That was when they'd finally gotten off work. Chinese workers' willingness to toil under these kind of conditions without the benefit of insurance for very long hours is one of the key drivers of the China price. Until relatively recently, China's government was just fine with this arrangement. Migrants sent home so much money to the countryside that they were called factories without smoke. 
Migrants' wages have helped build countless homes in rural areas. They've paid for the education of countless siblings. And so understandably for a developing country, China has for a long time looked the other way as companies routinely ignored the law on both labor and the environment. Talking to factory managers, there was one expression that always came up when I discussed the law, and that was that the law was a beautiful law. It's, a, it's something to be admired and aspired to, but not something that you would actually realistically, realistically have to comply with. At this point, you might be thinking, well, isn't this just development? Didn't America and Europe and Japan go through the same process and their, go through their own dirty industrial revolution just like China is? And how, how can you, an American woman, impose your Western standards on China? I believe there's a difference between China's industrial revolution and those that have come before it. China's industrial revolution is taking place at a time when multinational retailers have enormous power in the global economy in an age of unprecedented globalization. All of us are much more connected by trade and therefore by standards and obligations for labor and the environment than ever before. Today, China's export manufacturing sector is a paradise for retailers. Not only are retailers saving a lot of money by just moving their orders to China, but even within China, if they don't like the price that one factory offers, they can always move their order to another factory down the road that makes the same product for less. Even when they're working with the same factory, they demand continual price cuts. One Taiwanese manufacturer I was talking to recently told me that it wasn't unusual for him to, uh, to have to produce 3% price cuts every quarter. That's 12% price cuts every year. So you can imagine, it's quite difficult in that situation to make a lot of money as a Chinese manufacturer. And in the pie of profits the, between the retailer and a manufacturer, the retailer makes much more. Of course, as I said, it's impossible to produce at the China price, uh, at a price as low as the China price while respecting workers' rights and protecting the environment. But since the protests against Nike and Walmart in the 1990s, retailers and brands have had to prove that they're not buying from sweatshops abroad. So these companies send inspectors out to the factories and make sure that they're not breaking the law, and even as they drive those same factories to push down their prices even lower. The result is an extraordinary game of cat and mouse. To survive this dual pressure for goods produced at developing world prices for developed world, developing world prices for under developed world conditions, Chinese factories, and to be fair, factories in other countries, have turned cheating into an art form. In my book, I tell the story of a Hong Kong businessman who owns a factory in southern China, Eugene Chan. In order to make Walmart think he is following the law, Chan creates an elaborate ruse. He orders a team of workers to produce fake time cards that show he's following the law. He coaches his workers to lie to Walmart about their working conditions. Chan is not unusual. This kind of forgery is so common at Chinese factories that there is now a cottage industry of falsification engineers, people who specialize in fooling Western brands. Chinese engineers have developed software that creates an entirely fake payroll record indistinguishable from the real payroll document. For Eugene Chan, the Hong Kong factory owner, falsif falsifying records left him uneasy. He was afraid he'd be caught. So instead of fake records, he decided to create a fake factory. A model or a five-star factory, as he called it, as nice as a five-star hotel that he could show Walmart's inspectors. Around the corner was one of several of the real factories, which he calls his shadow factory, that was actually producing the goods for Walmart. Walmart never saw the real factories. If Western retailers are putting so much pressure on Chinese factories for lower prices that Chinese factories have to create fake Chinese factories to survive, what other tactics are they using to get by? A quick answer that we've seen in the headlines recently is substituting cheaper raw materials to lower their costs. In order to make goods at the ever lower prices that we expect, Chinese factories are using lead-laced paint in their toys. They're putting melamine in the ingredients used in pet food and in milk. They're using formaldehyde in flooring and furniture. Is this good value? Is this sustainable? I believe the answer to both of these questions is no. Certainly the wages that Chinese factories have earned at export factories have, Chinese workers have earned at export factories have substantially improved the quality of living in rural China. And exports have definitely played a major role in driving China's economic growth over the last two decades. 
But the policies that Beijing has implemented over the last couple of years illustrate that Beijing agrees with me that it was not a sustainable policy or particularly good value for China either. China decided a few years ago that its heavy dependence on labor and resource intensive exports was not healthy, that it needed to slow down the economy and that it needed to act to reduce this imbalance, income gaps and imbalance between uh, rural areas and urban areas. Since 2005, Beijing's introduced a number of policies on tax, on the currency, on labor that have made life much harder for low-end export factories. A year ago, China introduced a new labor law that many factories complain significantly raised their costs. One European businessman told me recently that as a result of that law, it's now harder for him to fire his employees in China than it is in California. At the same time, China's workers themselves are rejecting the long hours and the low wages that are part of the China price. The workers that were born after China introduced its one-child policy in 1979, the so-called Baling Ho generation, are very different from the workers who built China's export boom. These Baling Ho workers were born, in a, they were born into smaller families. They're wealthier than their parents. They're technology savvy. Virtually every worker in export factories has a cell phone and has, is often online. These workers want skills and experience, not just money, and they will walk if you don't give them what they want. A manager at the world's largest microwave factory, which has 40,000 workers in southern China, says there are two words to describe this generation of workers, spoiled, rotten. <laughs> Take Huang Weimu, a young man with nothing more than a junior high school education from one of China's poorest provinces. This man decided early last year that even under China's new labor law, factories were still taking advantage of workers. So he took a job at a clothing factory that he knew was not following the law. And he documented all of the ways that it was taking advantage of its workforce, not only saving his own pay stubs, but also collecting the pay stubs of his fellow workers and f fishing them out of the trash and then loading them up onto a computer in a cyber cafe near his factory. Then he took all of that information to the government and presented them with this evidence after five, five months at the factory. That in itself is not that unusual in China. There are workers who come to the government with complaints about factories all the time. What was most interesting about Huang Weimu was that while he took it, the same time he took it to the government, he also took his concerns online. And he simultaneously published all of his findings on his own website. And if you go to his website today, you'll see that after he published all of that online, he became a national celebrity with appearances on CTTV, Phoenix, and other TV channels. And his, his blog is much more uh, advanced than my blog with these clips, video clips. He's now a, a national celebrity. In Guangdong province, where your iPod, your shoes, and a lot of your consumer electronics were made, labor disputes tripled in 2008. There are now ambulance chasing lawyers lining up outside factories. And the most surprising thing is that more often than not, as we know, the workers are winning. Not all of these Baling Ho workers want to just make a point like Huang, Wei, Huang Weimu does. Some just want a better quality of life. I also tell the story in my book of a woman called Lu Yuan, who came from rural Jiangxi province. She works at a string of factories making everything from mugs to DVD players to sweaters. And, but eventually, at the sweater factory, she gets tired of the constraints in her life, of the repetitiveness of her work. And so she quits her job at the sweater factory, and in a way that is only possible in China, marches across the street and becomes a real estate agent. And within three months, she's carrying a fake Marc Jacobs bag. She's drinking red wine. She's putting on eye makeup. She has a better phone than I do. And if you ask her what she likes about her current life, she'll tell you she likes the freedom. Not freedom in an American sense, but the freedom to shape her own destiny. And that desire for freedom, I think, is a very powerful driver for this young generation of workers. These workers and the new labor law are not the only pressures on Chinese factories. In fact, the biggest problem facing Chinese factories today is that Americans aren't shopping the way they used to. Tens of thousands of factories have shut down in the last year alone, and I'm sure thousands more will close down this year. Ironically, though, I think this global slowdown may well turn out to be a good thing for China. Beijing has wisely realized that its first priority in this slowdown is its people, and it's pushed social stability to the top of its agenda. To ensure social stability, China's announced a raft of measures 
everything from healthcare to loans for uh, rural uh, workers to uh, plans to offer rural uh, migrants retraining. Those who've lost their jobs in the factories can now retrain uh, and learn how to use a computer, for instance. Crucially, it hasn't tried to uh, devalue the renminbi and try to make its exports competitive. China is bravely allowing this consolidation that began as a result of the pressures I've described on, on its manufacturing base to accelerate. Factories are closing down in Guangdong and reopening in inland provinces where labor and land costs are lower. The government estimates that 20 million workers have already lost their jobs. What we're seeing in China today, I believe, is similar to what America saw a, dec a century ago um, when we saw strikes and increasingly activist workers, tougher laws in Massachusetts, which was still America's main textile manufacturing base. Some factories went bankrupt and others moved south. This kind of progress in China will also help to reduce some of the imbalances that we've seen in China's economic development and encourages companies that remain on the coast to invest more in design and research and development. Chinese factories are, are going to need better management not only to handle those baling ho, spoiled rotten workers, but also because they're going to need to offer better services, whether it's an on-site fabric center or a design center that sets them apart from other factories. Whether or not China has the capability to innovate, whether or not its factories can compete in more sophisticated industries, whether or not the country can build brands, these questions will all become much more relevant in coming years. For us in America, while we struggle with our own recession and our own challenges, I believe one of the larger questions that we might do well to think about is this question of our consumer appetites and their global consequences, this question I mentioned at the beginning of value. I believe we in the West have become addicted to the bargain to the lure of a lifestyle enhanced by ever cheaper electronics and furniture and clothing. There's nothing wrong with wanting things cheaper, but to satisfy those appetites, as we all know here in Michigan very well, we've moved a lot of our manufacturing base somewhere else. My younger brother, who's an industrial engineer, tells me that jobs like his are rapidly disappearing and moving to China. It does make me wonder what, what we Americans are preparing ourselves to do. You know, and do we need all of this cheap stuff? I don't believe the answer to any of these questions is protectionism or a boycott of Chinese-made goods or pointless pressure on the value of China's currency. The Chinese and American economies are so closely intertwined that we can't afford to wage needless battles. I, what I do believe we must do is look more closely at ourselves. Have we asked the companies that we work for and the stores that we give our money to every day whether they are behaving in ways that are safe and sustainable overseas, not only for their shareholders, but also for all of us as American consumers and workers? Are our leaders pressing China on the issues that matter, issues like intellectual property protection, the environment, equal access for foreign companies into the Chinese market? Are we using our expertise accumulated over generations in occupational health and safety and environmental protection to be a good partner to China? Are we investing enough in the education of our own workforce so that we can prosper along a, a, alongside a more developed China? Is there a better way to balance capitalism and development? These questions touch on what, what I believe is one of the most compelling questions in our increasingly globalized world, how societies cope with rapid, rapid economic change. When General Motors lays off people in Michigan and moves that work to Mexico, what do the people left behind in Mex Me Michigan do? <coughs> Whose responsibility is it to retrain them? and help them find new jobs? Is it General Motors' responsibility or the state of Michigan? And how does an economy and a community that depended very heavily on one industry find a new lease on life? This is a question that I believe applies as much to Michigan as it does to Guangdong, my adopted home province in China. Caijing, China's leading business magazine, estimates that 30% of Guangdong's labor-intensive factories have already shut down. Last weekend, I was in Jiangxi province and I was asking many of the migrant workers home for the Chinese New Year there this question about how economies can adapt. Who, when you lose your job, whose responsibility is it to help you find a new one? What are you going to do if you lose your job in this economic downturn? Should the government be helping you? Should your previous employer be helping you? Their answer surprised me. Every single one from the owner of a small food stand to a construction worker who'd been working in Hangzhou said the same thing. We will rely on ourselves. We will rally together as families, and we will 
survive by the strength of our own wits. In these tumultuous times, perhaps that's sage advice for all of us. Thank you very much. Um, this is a fascinating uh, talk, and thank you to share this experience with us. Now, I, I, I'm a life science uh, uh, researcher, so, so social science is not my cup of tea, but I, I thought this is quite interesting. My question, probably a little bit outside of what you have talked about today, but the things I uh, especially today, look at the financial crisis in this country. How much, the question you ask, what is the value? I thought, you know, if we go a little bit beyond, beyond that, you should ask uh, how much is enough hmm. for the capitalism, for the CEOs. From the top, the reason you go to China um, from this country, the retailers, I think that everything is related to how much money they're going to squeeze out of it. Then, if you can think about that question, as a life scientist, I'm also going to ask the question, is there a gene in ourselves <laughs> that will push us to make more money? <laughs> and maybe there's something to, to that point. I think it's an excellent, thought-provoking point to hear from a scientist. Um, and that's what's so great about coming to speak to you all, is to be able to hear from people from so many different um, walks of life. I, the only thing I would add is that, uh, and I, I, I definitely can't address any questions about genetics, but it is a question of capitalism, right, and the way that capitalism functions. Because it's not just for the CEO's compensation, it's also for the compensation of everyone. I mean, let's take uh, your average big American retailer. Um, if you are, uh, <laughs> let's take Walmart, for instance, just randomly. Um, if you are a sourcing executive within Walmart, your bonus is tied to how much you can squeeze down those prices and how you, what your margins look like. And so you're literally incentivized to keep pressing those prices down. And this is not uh, you know, a bad thing necessarily to, uh, to drive efficiency in a supply chain. But unfortunately, the way it's developed um, in part because of, of China's availability, huge availability of factories, uh, the, um, it's, you know, you're pushing prices down and, and driving conditions down at the same time. It's possible, though, to think of another model where you actually work with factories closely the way, now this is an awful model right now to say in Michigan, but in the auto industry, in its best of times, uh, big OEMs work very closely with key suppliers. And if, if retailers decided to do that, this is one of Walmart's stated policies, is to streamline its supply chain and try to work with fewer factories. Then they have a better chance of working towards efficiencies without driving down conditions, as long as they keep it in their mind that they really care about labor and environmental conditions. So the, I, I guess it's a, it's a question all around about everyone wanting to make money, not just the CEO, but also the, the guy, the sourcing guy, and the shareholders, the investors. You know, I, I do research for investors now, and they're really not interested in those social and environmental issues. They couldn't care less. So I think we all have to think about whether we care about these issues and whether ultimately we're moving in the right direction or the wrong one. Yeah. Uh, yeah thank you for the presentation. I echo the uh, gentleman's comments there. Um, so I was struck by a, a parallel or uh, something in, in your in your talk that you spoke of the the migrant workers who did not have the insurance um, yeah. and uh, have the the lower socioeconomic status. And in the United States, for example, many of Walmart's customers come from a similar background. Uh, you know, don't have insurance, and so you know, some would argue or they might say, how, how am I supposed to you know internalize this China, the, the China price or, you know, take into account all the externalities that, that you've described. So if they would say that to you, how, what's your response? You know, there's, I can't afford to take this into account. I'm barely getting by uh, myself. Right. This is a, uh, a frequent um, 
question <laughs> that I get. And I think that the issue is not, well, right now the way it's structured, as I just explained with this sort of surfeit of factories and uh, you know, basically bouncing from factory to factory every three months, um, you know, you, Walmart is able to, and other retailers for that matter, are able to extract these price declines while uh, not, you know, while those factories aren't paying the proper social insurance, for instance. If you worked with factories more closely, you could, in theory, generate efficiency gains that would, that would, within a, you know, in a fair way, lower prices. That is the way, you know, things are done in places where there's actually even law enforcement. Um, you know, Honda, Toyota, company, these are companies that continually lower their costs without, uh, well, some would argue they still infringe on workers' rights, but with a better labor protection record. So it doesn't necessarily mean that those goods have to cost more. My question is, President Barack Obama, question mark, I have been an open and avid advocacy of the election of President Barack Obama for the last year. I would like to know if you think that President Barack Obama will take the reins, so to speak, will call for not only a national recognition of the need for fundamental human rights reforms in the United States, but internationally, including China. International rights to affordable public transportation, housing, health care, and education on a lifetime basis, and if that will have an impact on their trade with China and also, I'd like to know if you believe that President Obama and his administration will take on what has been described as the all-too-free laissez-faire markets involved in our trade with China. Thank you. Thank you for a very thoughtful question. I can't really speak to what the Obama administration may or may not do, but I do think you raise a really interesting point about uh, you know, us having an opportunity to reevaluate the way our system has functioned, whether it's trade or whether it's our banks or, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're at a moment, and I find this not only in America, but I travel frequently to Japan and, and often to, you know, obviously to China, where people are reevaluating the rules that we've played by and up until now. And so if, it, if we do all agree, or most of us agree, that we want those kinds of universally recognized rights, then then certainly um, that is, that's, that's a positive step. Um, but for the moment, it would seem to me that we, that we don't have much chance of uh, making significant progress on those things with China because there is a huge power of, of corporations that, and I'm not saying corporations are bad, I'm just saying that, uh, you know, we, I'm, not, I'm not for fettered trade in any way. I, I'm all for free trade, but I do think that in some ways we, we could do better within the context of the way companies are managed, for instance, without having to regula regulate or introduce a whole new bunch of trade agreements. Um, thank you for your very nice talk. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised to, uh, I think some maybe other people here, that your speech was uh, a moral speech more than it was an economic speech in some ways. So it needs to be heard in this environment and elsewhere. Uh, my question is this. I was told that I was, by one of my 10 brothers and sisters, that I was the last American to finally go into Walmart. I, I walked into my first Walmart last year. Maybe I was. Like it? Have you been there? Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, I was surprised. And I, I know Walmart is very controversial. I've been reading the newspapers. But I was surprised how low the prices were there. I understood why Walmarts are everywhere, almost everywhere. And I realized that Walmart is the largest employer of all the companies in the United States, with the possible exception of the US government. And I look at this economy that we're in, and I'd like to know from you what would happen when Walmart starts laying off people in this desperate, especially for the middle class in the 
what I call the working class of America. What could Walmart do, taking into account this fact that they are the largest employer, and certainly we don't want to see more people losing their jobs coast to coast, what would you recommend Walmart do in order to preserve jobs and yet be more uh, productive and efficient without being uh, immoral? That's a great question. Does anyone else have an answer? <laughs> we have an answer in the blue. Walmart laid off all 800 people in Arkansas yesterday. Oh. That's scary news. Yeah. It's scary times. Oh, man, just because I couldn't answer one question. There we go. <laughs> Thank you for coming. How homogenous would you say China is? And how much national pride do you think they have? And what do you think the chance, chances are that it might split up along ethnic lines the same way that the Soviet Union did? And what would those ethnic lines be? That was a lot of questions. That's great. So um, China is, what's remarkable is China, because I've spent a long time in Japan, which is quite a homogenous country. China is not homogenous, certainly not compared to Japan. And you'll see a lot of different ethnic groups um, you know, traveling around China. There are parts of China that I know some of uh, the people in the audience have lived in that are very different from the Shenzhen and the Dongguan that I know. Um, and so there are, there are a, a, a mix of people, and that's part of the reason why people say that China has been more open to accepting foreign capital, uh, unlike Japan, which when it went through its growth spurt, didn't. Um, so, you know, whether I think, I, I don't think there's a very a high likelihood that China is going to split up along ethnic lines. Um, I don't. I don't study the Uyghurs, and, uh, and that's not my specialty. But, um, and so I can't really speak to where, where the state of tensions are with them right now. But I bet there are people in the audience who could answer that question better than I could. So I, I just, I know, you know my area very well. And within that area, the government keeps a strong hand uh, on dissent. And, uh, and its number one priority is stability. And so I was talking to someone the other day about this, whether you know, there's talk now in China about social instability and whether workers themselves might uh, you know, organize and uh, create trouble, trouble in this year of anniversaries in China. And uh, this uh, labor sort of dispute resolution man that I was talking to said, no, no, anytime anyone sort of pops their head up above the parapet as an organizer, the government takes them out like a, with, like a sniper. <laughs> I don't think that that's an accurate description, but it was kind of a, it's certainly true that the activists I know who are in, involved with a lot of workers operate with a sort of an electric, an invisible electric fence. You know, they, the fence is constantly moving, but you know, you can, it's very clear when you zap up against it. So with that, I think that that makes me think that it's very unlikely that you'd see massive unrest because the, the government would try to keep a, a control over it before it bubbled over into anything that big. Yes. Oh, thank you for an excellent uh, presentation. I just wanted to ask about the role of food and food prices in China when it comes to getting to the China price, because we talk very much about the environmental costs and the human costs and labor rights, but it's also a fact that uh, these low wages that people are being paid are sustained by the fact that food prices in China are generally lower than the rest of the world. And now we're seeing perhaps the worst drought China has experienced in 50 years which will push uh, wheat prices up. I remember two years ago, pork prices went up and people were talking. How, and in, in your sort of sense, uh, how much does food prices and the need to keep them low and also potentially exploiting peasants, farmers, uh, figure in, in, in this equation? Well, with regard to the factories, um, certainly food is a, a big cost, the daily cost of a worker's existence. But you know, with regard to the factory cost, it's it's basically next to nothing in terms of product price. Um, but yeah, you're right that if you if food prices were double or triple what they were, that would absolutely have an impact on workers, um, you know, take home wages after they're finished finished paying for food and and shelter. But um, you know, one of the things being in the countryside, people talked about constantly was the high price of food. Um, it was it was an interesting comment. It wasn't just food; it was everything. Um, that if you know you buy a jacket out in the countryside, it's 180 renminbi. In the cities, it's only 100. 
and that may be a reflection of uh, distribution. Um, sort of like when we go to Walmart, it's cheaper because they've got better distribution, and there's just no Walmart out there in the countryside. But uh, it's certainly a constant refrain from my Chinese friends uh, that food prices are high, high and rising, um, even without the pork spike and the drought, even before that. So it's certainly the number one expense for these workers, and, and obviously very directly connected to their families' wages back in the countryside. Um, but this year, uh, you know, my impression is that the government will do everything it can to make sure rural and, and migrant workers are uh, at least calm, not, not stirred up, regardless of droughts. Yes, in the back. Um, do you think the China price will go up in the next few years? Uh, and if that happens, uh, what do you think it will affect the uh, American economy? Thanks. Great question. The China price rose for the first time basically in m many years uh, in 2008. Um, as my book was coming out, <laughs> the China price started to tick up upwards because of the rise in commodity costs, the new labor law, um, and, uh, and the appreciation of the renminbi. Those are the main factors. And, and, so, and, they, and the workers themselves are behind that. They're, you know, they were part of, I think, the reason that China introduced the new labor law was the shift in worker mentality. And, the, and the, of course, the demographic situation, which means China has a dwindling supply of new uh, workers. What's happened this year is that uh, the China price is not, not, I don't know about the actual statistics, but anecdotally, the China price is falling again um, by about 5 to 10 percent um, because the commodity co prices have come off again. Um, and so what, you know, I, I know someone who sent a letter to 14 of his Chinese factories is a guy who buys electronics and different products from China at the beginning of the year, and he said, okay, everyone, send me back your bids. Everyone's going to have to lower their prices. And, and that's what I'm hearing universally from people. My view is, so uh, we've got these temporary fluctuations, and it's, you know, up 5 10%, down um, 5 10%, or up 20% one year down. The long-term trend is that the China price rises. Um, because even going into rural China, I had expected to find that wages were significantly lower. But in this town that I visited in Jiangxi province, uh, the factories there were paying 1,200 renminbi a month, which is the low end of wages in Guangdong province. And so that's their starting base now. It's got to go up from there. Um, so you, I think there is continual upward pressure, slow upward pressure on the China price long term. That hits, first it hits the margins of American retailers and American brands. Um, they will do everything they can not to pass that on to consumers because they know American consumers are so price sensitive. But I think we are, we in America are going to be sourcing from China for decades to come and we'll have to live with a gradual price increase and perhaps a gradual erosion of margins for retailers and brands. Uh, Thank you again for your talk. Uh, I've also enjoyed it very much. A very quick aside, my China price for the auto parts I buy uh, is higher. For 2008, it was much higher than 2005. It grew steadily from 2005 to 2008. We're falling a little bit, but we're back to maybe 2007 levels now. But my question, uh, I heard your comments about uh, trying to, the government's efforts to try to promote stability in the rural areas and to try to you know, help encourage economic development. But I've been hearing for a number of years that that's been a priority of the government, mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like that's been very slow. Do you have yeah. any reason to believe that uh, that will accelerate? Are there things that are different this time in you know, the effort to try to uh, build the economy in the rural areas? Well, um, a couple things are new. The retraining of migrant workers is new on this scale. The uh, loans, subsidized loans to uh, rural residents is a new, a relatively new program. Um, giving rural residents coupons to buy um, uh, appliances was a previously experimental program that's just launched nationally this year. The idea is to turn peasants into consumers and to create a domestic um, economy, a domestic you know, consumption boom. Uh, in the middle of a you know, downturn. But it's, uh, it, those are new in my mind. Of course, the emphasis on rural workers is, um, is, is not new. But it seems to have uh, swiftly moved up the agenda this year as uh, everyone I speak to in Beijing, Shanghai, and elsewhere uses the term panic when they talk about this year and policy. We are in panic mode. 
um, is what people tell me. And so the concern is uh, unrest among various groups, among them, you know, uh, disgruntled peasants, but also migrant workers, you know, recent college graduates. The list is probably much longer in, in corridors of people who know these things better than I do. Yes. So the, we have time for one last question. Of course, it's across the room. It's like Oprah. <laughs> Our very own. <laughs> I enjoyed your talk immensely. Thank you. Uh, what about the uh, pollution of the water supply? Is the government uh, attempting to deal with this at all? Yes. Um, you know, I'm not a pollution expert, but it's, uh, it was certainly the... Um, now Ministry, I guess, of Environmental Protection was strengthened and uh, had sort of was able to start enforcing uh, things more strongly last year. Um, people I know, for example, who have big uh, chemicals plants, you know, their CEOs of chemicals companies told me that all their projects were being held up. Um, and the people I, it's, it's very local, you know, information, but for example, certain cities in uh, southern China refused to have uh, polluting industries anymore. So if you were a leather tannery, uh, the city of Shenzhen wouldn't even take an appointment with you. They didn't want your investment. Um, you could go to another town uh, two hours away, but there was, there was spotty um, sort of greater enforcement, and a lot of the factory managers, particularly Hong Kong and Taiwan invested factories, started to have to move out of southern China because the environmental laws or the enforcement of the environmental laws was getting a lot tougher. They made an example of a, uh, a, a Hong Kong-owned knitwear factory that was dumping exorbitant amounts of pollution into the local water supply and fined them, I think, a million U.S. dollars or something. Anyway, what I hear this year is that, uh, and it's only anecdotal, is that with the focus more on keeping people employed, that there's going to be less pressure on enforcing environmental laws and labor laws that um, you're, that we're going to be looking towards just trying to keep companies in business rather than putting more pressure on them environmentally or labor-wise. Thank you. I think we're out of time, so I want to thank Alex very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you.